Now, in this eighth psychology sociology lecture, we're going to be talking all about learning. So we'll talk about some forms of non-associative learning, which are habituation, dishabituation, and sensitization. And then we'll talk about different types of associative learning. So what is associative learning and what are the types and what are the processes involved in this type of learning? And then we'll dive into the specifics of classical conditioning, also called Pavlovian conditioning, and operant conditioning, two topics which come up time and time again on the MCAT. And we'll end with talking about observational learning, which we've touched on in a number of lectures before. And we'll talk about the processes involved in observational learning as well as modeling. So non-associative learning is any learning that doesn't involve the association between two stimuli or a stimulus and a specific outcome. Specifically, non-associative learning includes habituation, dishabituation, sensitization, and desensitization. And these are forms of learning and they largely take place in the central nervous system. And it's really key to know that these are types of learning. They are not the same as sensory adaptation, which we've talked about before. So a lot of people confuse sensory adaptation with habituation because they seem to be pretty similar. But sensory adaptation occurs at the level of the sensory receptors in the peripheral nervous system. So it's not a form of learning but it's instead how reactive your sensory receptors are to a certain stimulus. Whereas habituation is a form of learning. And habituation is a decrease in responsiveness to a repeated stimulus. So as I've said, it's not the same as sensory adaptation or fatigue. And these two processes actually have to be ruled out when habituation is being explored or studied as a learning process. So an example of habituation is, let's say there's constant construction going on outside your house every morning. And when it first goes on, you're extremely annoyed by it and you really notice it. But over time, it keeps happening every morning and you start to become less distracted and less irritated. Now, dishabituation is sort of like the undoing of habituation. So after a repeated stimulus is removed for a period of time and then reintroduced, there's an enhanced responsiveness to it. So usually the way dishabituation works is habituation occurs, then that ongoing stimulus is removed, there's some you know, pause period of time, then the stimulus is reintroduced, and then there's a heightened responsiveness, which is dishabituation. So continuing with our construction example, Let's say the construction ceases for a month and then it comes back and your response of annoyance and distraction as a result of the sound is extremely heightened above what it was before. And then finally, sensitization. And this is the opposite of habituation, where habituation is a decrease in responsiveness to a constant stimulus. Sensitization is an increase in responsiveness to a repeated stimulus. And this often happens with repeated stimuli that are causing physical pain or an emotional response. And that pain or emotion is going to increase as the stimulus is repeated. Sensitization also often occurs with drugs of addiction, especially stimulants. And usually with regards to stimulants, there's sensitization with regards to the individual's motor response to the drug. So I think when people think of drugs of addiction, they usually just think of tolerance, but sensitization also occurs. And oftentimes there's both sensitization and tolerance occurring, but for different effects of that drug. And then an example from pop culture that I like to think of, or a way to help me remember sensitization, is the episode of Family Guy, where Stewie is yelling at his mom, Lois, and he's saying, Mom, Mummy, Mom mummy over a long period of time and in the beginning Lois seems pretty annoyed but finally she absolutely explodes so her level of irritation to the repeated stimulus all of a sudden increases and she yells at Stewie to stop. So I included this diagram here 
to show that different types of learning are found under different types of memory. So learning about facts or events or experiences in your life are going to be under declarative, also called explicit memory, whereas non-associative learning, so sensitization, habituation, and dishabituation, as well as classical conditioning, which is a type of associative learning, are going to be found largely in our non-declarative or explicit memory. So now that we've talked about non-associative learning, let's move on to associative learning. And associative learning is generally when a stimulus becomes associated with a certain response or with another stimulus. But if you think about associative learning, just know that it's basically all learning that isn't non-associative learning. So non-associative learning is these three main processes that we learned about here. And really any other type of learning, including observational learning, semantic learning, episodic learning, etc., these are forms of associative learning. So some of the main types, we have classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning, all of which we'll talk extensively about today. Then there's imprinting. And imprinting is learning that occurs in animals that has to happen during a certain critical period. So imprinting is, for example, an innate behavior like ducks following their mother. So during a certain period, imprinting occurs, and that imprinting causes them to associate their mother with the figure to follow around. And I'm sure you've seen the mother duck followed by three little baby ducks, or sorry, multiple baby ducks behind the mother. And if they missed that critical period of imprinting, then they wouldn't be able to perform that behavior. Also, associative learning is just general learning that we do in school, for example, learning about new facts, ideas, and new experiences. So that's called episodic learning, as well as learning cultural and social expectations, language, etc. So there are some processes involved and specific terms that you should know for the MCAT. Insight learning. So we talked about insight as a mechanism of problem solving. And insight learning is when you have a sudden realization, almost like it's a flash of inspiration. So it's like an aha moment. Um, and when we first talked about it, I compared it to Jimmy Neutron's brain blast. So insight learning can't really be planned. It just has to come to you. Um, and it's a sudden realization. And then we have latent learning. And that's learning that goes on passively, sort of behind the scenes, without obvious reinforcement of the behavior or information being learned. Another characteristic of this type of learning is that the behavior or information that's learned is not expressed immediately, but only when prompted or only when required. So an example is, let's say you drive with your mom to her work every day, um, but you're in the back seat and you're not doing the driving, so you're not really paying attention or at least consciously paying attention to the route you take. But one day you need to pick up your mom from work and you realize that you actually do know the way to her work. So latent learning had occurred each time that you were on the way to her work, and you weren't really aware of that it was happening until you were prompted to perform that behavior of getting, her, of getting to her work. We also have many innate or instinctive behaviors. And these are fixed patterns of behavior, and usually responses to certain stimuli, that are found across a species, so an instinctive behavior is uniform across the species. And we, it's called a biological predisposition because we're biologically predisp predisposed to display certain behaviors in response to certain stimuli. A term listed on the content guide related to this is instinctive or sometimes called instinctual drift. And this is the tendency of an animal to revert back to instinctive behaviors during the process of conditioning. So oftentimes you're trying to condition an animal, teach it to do a particular thing. Oftentimes that behavior, the learning of that new behavior it dis is disrupted because instinctive drift occurs and the individual drifts back to their innate behaviors. So the first main type of associative learning that we'll discuss is classical conditioning. And to sum it up, classical conditioning occurs when a stimulus that naturally produces some reflexive response is repeatedly paired with a neutral stimulus. 
so one that doesn't produce some reflexive response. And the repeated pairing of those two stimuli results in the neutral stimulus also evoking that reflexive response. So the neutral stimulus almost becomes a substitution or almost becomes a mimic of the reflexive or natural stimulus. And Pavlov is the psychologist associated with classical conditioning, and Pavlov's dog is really the um, quintessential example of classical conditioning. So the number of terms that come along with this type of learning, and you should know all of these terms for the MCAT. So there's some unconditioned stimulus, and this is the stimulus that naturally produces some reflexive response. So for example, a shock could be an unconditioned stimulus that naturally causes pain. A loud sound could be an unconditioned stimulus that naturally causes a startle response. And the reflexive response that it causes is called the unconditioned response. So these are unconditioned, meaning they don't have to be learned. They're natural and reflexive. So when we're looking at Pavlov's dog, the unconditioned stimulus is food or a steak here. And that steak naturally produces the unconditioned response of salivation. A neutral stimulus is one that doesn't produce some reflexive response. So for example, with Pavlov's dog, ringing the bell doesn't naturally produce any response. During conditioning, what occurs is that the neutral stimulus is repeatedly paired with the unconditioned stimulus. And specifically, the neutral stimulus is presented just before the unconditioned stimulus. So with Pavlov's dog, the bell is rang, and then the dog is presented with its steak. And during conditioning, that still results in the steak, or the unconditioned stimulus, triggering the unconditioned response. But over time, meaning throughout the period of conditioning, the neutral stimulus becomes associated with and really is predictive of the presentation of the unconditioned stimulus. So the dog is learning when the bell is present, the food is also going to be present. After conditioning, the neutral stimulus has become a conditioned stimulus once the animal has been conditioned. And condition occurs, conditioning occurs once that neutral stimulus can also elicit the reflexive response. So after conditioning, these new terms are used. The neutral stimulus has become a conditioned stimulus because now it causes the response. And that response, when elicited by the conditioned stimulus, is called the conditioned response. So that response is still salivation, but if elicited by the stake, it's called an unconditioned response. And if elicited by the stimulus that has had to be learned, then it's called a conditioned response because that response isn't natural, it had to be learned. So this terminology is crucial. After learning, the neutral stimulus has been transformed into a conditioned stimulus, and it elicits the conditioned response. And that is because the conditioned stimulus is now predictive of the unconditioned stimulus. So the dog hears the bell and thinks, well, food must be coming soon, and starts to salivate. So there are a couple more terms to know with regards to classical conditioning. Acquisition is the process of acquiring that classical conditioning. So it's the process of conditioning during which the unconditioned stimulus is paired with the neutral or what becomes the conditioned stimulus. So the subject is learning that the presence of the conditioned stimulus signals the arrival of the unconditioned stimulus shortly after. So acquisition is just the process of learning. Extinction. So I said that during conditioning, what the animal or human is learning is that the conditioned stimulus signals the arrival and is predictive of the unconditioned stimulus. So the bell signals arrival of the stake. But if after conditioning, the bell is presented alone time and time again, the animal is also going to begin to learn that the bell doesn't always signal arrival of the food. And in fact, the bell may no longer signal arrival of the food. And so extinction is the extinction of the conditioned response. And the conditioned response actually decreases gradually over time if the CS is continually presented alone. 
And by alone, I mean without the unconditioned stimulus. So this takes some time, so for a while the conditioned response will remain, even if the conditioned stimulus is presented alone. But after a long period of time of CS presented alone, then the response will decrease. Now there's also a phenomenon known as spontaneous recovery. And spontaneous recovery is, as it sounds, a sudden and spontaneous recovery of the conditioned response. So it's the sudden reappearance of a previously conditioned response that had gone extinct. And how this usually works is conditioning occurs, then the CS is presented alone and time passes and extinction occurs. So that conditioned response decreases over time. Then, after some rest period, so no presentation of the conditioned stimulus, after that rest period, oftentimes there's a spontaneous recovery of the conditioned response, meaning the conditioned stimulus could be presented alone, and all of a sudden the animal would show the conditioned response, even though it hadn't during extinction. Generalization. Generalization occurs when a stimulus that is similar to the conditioned stimulus is also able to elicit the conditioned response. So, for example, with Pavlov's dog, the sound of the bell is the conditioned stimulus, and that elicits the salivation. But, if generalization occurred, then a similar sound, as long as it's similar enough to the bell, could also elicit salivation. So for example, maybe a doorbell could also elicit the conditioned response, or a chime, or a strum of a piano key. So really the animal generalizes the conditioned stimulus to things that are similar to the CS, and those also are going to trigger the CR. And a really classic experiment that depicted generalization is Little Albert. And this was done um, in the early 20th century by a psychologist named Watson at Johns Hopkins. And it was a study of classical conditioning. So this baby here, baby Albert, was conditioned to associate a furry white rat with a loud frightening noise. So the furry white rat at first was a neutral stimulus. The baby was not afraid of it. But the baby was afraid and startled by the loud noise. So during conditioning, the white rat was presented, followed by a loud and frightening noise, and then the conditioned response that developed over time was crying. And generalization occurred in this experiment. So what happened is Albert not only became frightened and cried and screamed when a white rat was presented, but also it cried and screamed when any other white furry objects were given to it. So for example, here you can see an, an image from the study, and it says now he even fears Santa Claus. So Santa Claus has this white furry beard, and stimulus generalization occurred such that the baby now fears anything similar to a white rat, so anything white and furry. So Santa Claus even results in the conditioned response. And then the opposite, process of generalization is discrimination. And discrimination occurs when only a very specific stimulus can elicit the conditioned response. So similar stimuli won't be able to elicit the same response. So for example, let's say for Pavlov's dog, a doorbell or a chime or a similar noise could not elicit the conditioned response, and only that bell could elicit the response. That would be an example of discrimination. Now classical conditioning plays an integral role in many of the processes that underlie substance addiction. So I'm sure you guys have heard of the idea that when an individual does a drug in a certain environment, that environment is going to elicit expectation of the drug. So how does that work? Well, this is really an example of conditioning. So before conditioning, meaning conditioning being the addictive use of that drug. So before the addictive use of that drug, the drug is an unconditioned stimulus and it triggers a natural compensatory reaction of the body. So what happens in the body when an individual takes a drug of abuse, the body is trying to reach homeostasis, 
So it uses mechanisms to counteract what the drug is doing. So if the drug is increasing heart rate um, and increasing respiratory rate, the compensatory reaction of the body will be to bring that heart rate and respiratory rate back down. So it tries to counteract the drug in order to bring the body back to homeostasis. Now I found this diagram online and I should note that there's one error. So before conditioning, the drug is the unconditioned stimulus and the environmental cues are the neutral stimulus. So this part here is the part of the diagram that's incorrect. But let's continue. So before conditioning, the drug is the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response is the compensatory reaction. Environmental cues. Before conditioning, these are a neutral stimulus. So they don't trigger any natural response. And the environmental cues are just cues of the environment that the individual will take the drug in. Now conditioning occurs when the individual begins taking that drug in a specific environment. And that drug taking is addictive, so it occurs very frequently. And what happens is the environmental cues become associated with the drug. So the environmental cues were a neutral stimulus, but the environmental cues began to signal administration of the drug, meaning that they became a conditioned stimulus. And we know that the conditioned stimulus is going to elicit the same response as the unconditioned stimulus. So if the unconditioned stimulus elicited the compensatory reaction, the environmental cues, which now signal presentation of the drug, are also going to have been conditioned to elicit the conditioned response, which is the compensatory reaction of the body. Now what happens when an individual is addicted, oftentimes they might take the drug in a new environment. And what doctors and psychologists have seen is that oftentimes taking the drug in a new environment is very dangerous and can result in overdose at a higher rate than taking the drug in the normal environment. And that's because if you remove the environmental cues, so you remove the conditioned stimulus because the individual is taking the drug in a new place, so those cues are no longer present, then there's no more compensatory reaction of the body, meaning that the drug is going to have its full effect on the individual and they'll overdose because they no longer have those cues to trigger the body to enact its counteractive or compensatory mechanisms. And then this conditioning also underlies craving and relapse. So if the in individual is, let's say, not using the drug at the time, so they're sober, and they all of a sudden go in the new place, go in the old place that they used to take the drug in, or see some various stimuli that are associated with the drug. So for example, an IV drug user might see a needle, um, they might see a spoon, or some other, you know, a pipe, some other paraphernalia. And that environmental cue will trigger the compensatory reaction in their body and cognitively will trigger craving and potentially even relapse. So if the compensatory reaction is occurring, the individual is not going to like that reaction. That's going to be discomfort, discomforting. And that might result in the individual trying to cope with the compensatory reaction by relapsing. Or just the cognitive effect of craving. Because the environmental cues usually signaled the drug. So they're going to be expecting the drug, thinking about the drug, etc. Now one way that conditioning is used in the lab nowadays is to measure the effects or the addictive tendencies of certain drugs and usually done using rats. So this is a conditioned place preference test, sometimes abbreviated the CPP. So what happens is the animal has an environment with two different sides. So one side might be a different color than the other, might have a different flooring than the other, etc. And what happens is there's an unconditioned stimulus, which is the drug, and that's going to trigger an unconditioned response, which is pleasure. And during conditioning, one of the sides of the environment, so in this example, the black side of the room, is going to be conditioned to be associated with the drug. So the black side of the room is first a neutral stimulus, so the rat's just exploring. It won't have an innate preference for either side. But that black context, which was a neutral stimulus, gets paired with the drug. So that's the pairing of the 
neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. And over time, that neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. So that black side of the environment is going to predict the presentation of the drug. And so that means that being in that side of the environment will be an inherently pleasurable to the rat because it's expecting the drug. And so in this test, the addictive or pleasurable qualities of the drug will be assessed by seeing how much time the rat spends on the black side of the environment. Okay, so now let's move on to the other type of conditioning, operant conditioning. And operant conditioning occurs when the frequency of a certain behavior is increased or decreased due to the presentation of a consequence that follows that behavior. So the individual does some behavior and that behavior is either rewarded or punished. And if the behavior is rewarded, then that behavior will increase in frequency in the future. And if it's punished, then that behavior will decrease in frequency in the future. And this is operant conditioning is sometimes called trial and error learning, or at least associated with trial and error learning. So in trial and error learning, an individual tries out something, and if it doesn't work, then they're not going to get the reward or not going to get the correct answer. So that's going to be the punishment. They're going to try out something else, and eventually something works. They find some solution, and that solution won't be rewarded, and then that solution is going to stick with them when they encounter that problem again in the future. And operant conditioning is associated with Skinner. And you guys may have heard of the Skinner box, and this is an apparatus that's used in the lab to train animals using operant conditioning. So this is a Skinner box here. You have a rat. Um, you oftentimes have something like a speaker, lights. There might be an electrified grid um, and a food dispenser. So the food dispenser would be a reward. The electrified grid would be a punishment. And then there might be a lever here. And the lever is usually the behavior that the animal is going to be trained to do. So there are some terms that come along with operant conditioning. Positive means a stimulus is added. Negative means a stimulus is removed. So you'll see there are four possible consequences. Two are positive and two are negative. Reinforcement means that there's an increase in the frequency of the behavior after the consequence. And punishment means that there's going to be a decrease in the frequency of the behavior. So there are four possible consequences that are combinations of these terms. So remember, positive is adding something to the environment. Negative is removing something. Reinforcement is increasing the behavior. And punishment is decreasing the behavior. So positive reinforcement occurs when an appetitive or desirable stimulus is given. So that's a reward. And that's going to increase the frequency of a correct behavior. So let's say the rat presses the response lever and food is dispensed. That's going to be positive reinforcement. So a stimulus being food is added, and that's an appetitive desirable stimulus to increase the frequency of the correct behavior, which is lever pressing. And then there's negative reinforcement. And that's the removal of an undesired or noxious stimulus in order to increase a correct behavior. So let's say the electrified grid was on at a low level, but it was really uncomfortable for the rat. And once the rat pressed the response lever, then that electrified grid turned off. So a stimulus was removed from the environment and the animal liked that removal of the stimulus because the stimulus that was there was an undesirable stimulus. So that again is a type of reinforcement, so it's gonna increase the lever pressing. Then positive punishment. We're adding something to decrease behavior. So what's going to be added is an undesired or noxious stimulus to decrease the incorrect behavior. So let's say instead of pressing, let's say there are two response levers, one on the right and one on the left. And if the one on the right was the correct lever, but the rat pressed the one on the left, then positive punishment would be turning on the electrified grid. And then finally, negative punishment. So this is when a appetitive or desirable stimulus is removed to decrease the incorrect behavior. So again, if the rat pressed the wrong lever and the food that was out gets removed. 
So this is a sort of tree of the possible outcomes that occur during operant conditioning. And you can see here, this is a summary of what we just went over, positive, negative reinforcement and punishment. And so reinforcement increases the behavior, and you can do that by adding a good stimulus or removing a bad stimulus. Punishment decreases the behavior, which you can do by adding a bad stimulus or removing a good stimulus. And there are great examples here. And then there are two different types of negative reinforcement. There's escape learning and avoidance learning. So in general, negative reinforcement is removing some undesirable stimulus. But there are two variations. Avoidance learning occurs when the learner is going to learn to avoid an unwanted stimulus that would arrive after the correct behavior is not performed. So they learn to avoid an impending stimulus. And what I mean by that is the stimulus isn't there yet. But if the correct behavior isn't performed, then the noxious stimulus will occur. So an example of avoidance learning is, let's say um, you get cavities anytime you don't brush your teeth. Operant conditioning may occur to teach you to brush your teeth every night because you're avoiding cavities, because to you going to the dentist and getting the filling is a very unpleasant experience. So by brushing your teeth, you're avoiding the impendous, impending stimulus of getting a filling and going to the dentist. And then there's escape learning. And this is when learning occurs in order to escape or get rid of an ongoing and unwanted stimulus. So the noxious stimulus is present, but by performing the correct behavior, you can escape it or remove it. So an example of escape learning is turning off an alarm clock by pressing the snooze button. So the alarm clock is the noxious stimulus and it's ongoing, but you learn to perform the behavior to remove that ongoing stimulus. And the law of effect underlies all the principles of operant conditioning. So the law of effect basically says that any behaviors that result in a desirable outcome will increase in frequency, and any behaviors that result in an undesirable outcome will decrease in frequency. So this is an example of how operant conditioning might be tested and might look in the lab. We know things in the lab are never quite as clean cut as they are in theory. But here we have a cat that's locked up in a cage, and we know cats like to explore, so the cat doesn't want to be in that cage. That's a noxious stimulus for it. And so the cat wants to escape. But operant conditioning has to occur in order for the cat to be more quick at escaping. So in the first few trials, it takes the cat a long time to escape. So it hasn't learned yet. But over time, operant conditioning occurs, and it begins to learn what correct behavior it needs to perform so for example, maybe pressing on a specific lever a certain number of times. And it begins to learn, and so over successive trials, it gets out of the box in a shorter and shorter period of time. So this is evidence that operant conditioning has occurred. And there are, there are a few more terms that go along with operant conditioning. So we have a primary reinforcer and a secondary reinforcer. And a primary reinforcer is a stimulus that's used, of course, to reinforce a behavior. And that stimulus is innately appetitive. So a primary reinforcer is something that we biologically and naturally like. For example, food, water, sex, drugs of addiction. These are things that don't need to be trained for us to like them. We just naturally like them. And then there's secondary, sometimes called conditioned reinforcement. And this is when the stimulus that's used in reinforcement must have been conditioned at some point to become desirable to the learner. So a great example of this is money. So innately, to a baby, for example, or to, a, to someone who, let's say, is from another planet, paper money is not innately appetitive. But we learn through society and culture and through our development that money means we can buy things and do things. So money is a secondary reinforcer. A text message notification. 
So the actual sound, the bing of a text message, is not innately appetitive, but we learn to associate that with communication from our loved ones, and so it has been trained as an appetitive reinforcer. Good grades, the school bell ringing, signaling the end of school, things like that. And secondary reinforcers may be stimuli that were conditioned during classical conditioning. So for example, if Pavlov's dogs were trained in operant conditioning and we use the bell as the appetitive stimulus, that bell would be a secondary reinforcer because we had to train the dogs before that the bell meant food was coming. So the bell had to be conditioned in order to be appetitive to the dogs. And there are a couple processes that go along with operant conditioning. Shaping. So this is when we gradually, in steps, teach an animal to perform a complex behavior by breaking down that complex behavior and reinforcing it progressively. So let's say we want to teach a dog to roll over. We have to train the dog to do that in steps. We can't initially try and teach it to sit and roll over and listen to us. So we gradually shape that complex behavior. So we might first train the dog to just listen to our voice and to answer when we call its name. Then we'll teach the dog to sit down when we ask or perform a certain hand gesture. Next, we teach the dog that once it's sitting, we want it to lay down. And then once it's acquired that behavior, we teach the dog that after it's laying down, it needs to roll over once. And then finally, there's extinction. And this occurs when the conditioned behavior stops. And usually that's when the reinforcement or punishment has been removed from the situation and some time has passed. When behavior is be being reinforced, the correct behavior could be reinforced after every instance, or it could be reinforced intermittently. And if it's reinforced intermittently, then there are four different types of or four different schedules of reinforcement. So the schedules of reinforcement could be a ratio schedule or an interval schedule. And a ratio schedule occurs when the correct behavior is rewarded after a certain number of instances of the behavior. And an interval schedule occurs when the animal is rewarded after a certain amount of time. So a variable ratio schedule of reinforcement occurs when the reinforcement is given after a randomly changing number of instances of the correct behavior. So it's a variable number of correct instances of the behavior that are required to get the reward. So for example, if the food pellet is given after eight lever presses, then after 10, then after two, and then after four. And that number keeps changing randomly. And this is actually the best and quickest way to reinforce new behavior. Next, we have a fixed ratio, and this occurs when the reward is given after a certain fixed number of instances of the correct behavior. So, for example, if you give the rat the food pellet after every six lever presses. And what happens with a fixed ratio, as well as with a fixed interval, is that the animal begins to learn that you're giving the reward after a certain number of instances of the behavior. So let's say you're giving it after every six lever presses. What will happen is the frequency of lever presses will begin to increase at the end of each block of behavior. And what I mean by each block of behavior is that the lever presses four, five, and six will likely occur more quickly than lever presses one, two, three. So the animal knows that immediately following the last reward, it's not going to get another reward, but after a few more lever presses, it will get the reward. So what you actually see here is here's time and here's number of responses. And we're talking here about a fixed ratio. So this line here. And this line, this diagonal line is the reward being given. So if it's on a variable ratio, as we discussed, it's a randomly changing number of responses that are required to get the reward. But if it's a fixed ratio, you can see that immediately following presentation of the reward, 
the rate of behavior is rather slow, but then it increases, and it kind of results in this scalloped pattern. And then there's fixed interval, and this occurs when the reward is given after a fixed interval of time. So for example, the food pellet is given after every 20 seconds, as long as at least one instance of the behavior occurs within that interval. So the behavior still has to occur, it's not just getting a food pellet every 20 seconds, but as long as it occurs at least once within the time period, then it'll get the reward. So fixed interval here, you really see that scalloped pattern because the animal knows that, let's say after 30 seconds, it's gonna get a reward. So at the end of that time interval, it's gonna start increasing its rate of responsiveness. And then there's variable interval. And this occurs when the reward is given after a randomly changing amount of time. So for example, the food pellet is given after eight seconds, then after 15 seconds, then after two seconds, and the same goes for variable interval in that the, the animal has to at least perform one instance of the behavior during that time period in order to get the reward. So you can see here, variable ratio is the best and quickest way to train a new response. So the last type of learning we have to discuss is observational learning. And observational learning is of course learning that occurs in the social context from observing others. So modeling is learning by observing and then imitating others' actions. We've talked before about mirror neurons, but mirror neurons are extensively involved in observational learning. And this is a group of specialized neurons found in the cortex. And they've been specifically located in other species and are speculated to exist in humans. And these neurons fire under two conditions. They fire when we perform a certain action as well as when we observe others performing that same action. And that second type of activation is called vicarious motor activation. So they're firing due to the motor activity of another person. And mirror neurons are a vital component of social functioning. So they enable us to learn from watching others, that's called imitation or modeling, and to understand the behavior of others, so why others are behaving in a certain way. And our social functioning, evolutionarily, has been crucial to our success as a species. And it's speculated that the social difficulties that are seen in individuals with autism might be due to some issue, at least in part, with the mirror neuron system. So another thing on the double AMC guide is this topic here, the brain and vicarious emotion. A vicarious emotional response is just empathy. So that's when you feel emotion due to someone else's experiences or someone else's strife. And this response in the brain often occurs when a brain region is activated both by our own emotions and by observing others experience those same emotions. So almost like emotional mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are thought to be involved in humans, but it, is, it has been seen that there's brain activation in a similar area when I experience sadness and when I see someone else experience sadness. And that underlies empathy. It's also been seen that brain activity varies when individuals are faced with a situation in which they might empathize. And so this suggests that there's a potential neural basis for the differences in empathy or propensity to empathize across individuals. So some individuals who are described, at least in pop culture, as sociopaths or psychopaths are thought to have an inability to empathize and an inability to feel guilty or feel remorse for their actions. So there may be a neural basis for this behavior or this kind of personality disorder. Observational learning as a whole underlies many facets of our identity. So we learn right versus wrong from others. We mimic the behavior of those we spend extensive time with, and the environment we're raised in shapes our values, our attitudes, and our overall personality. Okay, so we've finished our discussion of learning.